so much for coming out to New Mercury at the City Lit Festival. As some of you know, uh, we normally do our readings at the wind-up space in the Station North Arts and Entertainment District the last Saturday of every month, uh, although not next month because of Memorial Day weekend, but we're also really happy to do these events with City Lit Society, the City Lit Festival in the spring, and the Baltimore Book Festival in the fall. Um, so today we've got a great slate of readers for you, and John is going to uh, introduce our first reader. Um, our first reader is named D. Watkins. He's, uh, I will read his biography, not his whole biography, but just <laughs> some of the important parts. He is a writer whose work has been published in the Huffington Post, Stop Being Face Famous, 1729 Magazine, uh, and Salon. Watkins has been featured on NPR's Sunday Morning, The Mark Steiner Show, and Huffington Post Live. He holds a master's in education at Johns Hopkins University and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Baltimore. He is an adjunct professor at Coffin State University and runs a creative writing workshop at Baltimore's Free School. I just want to say he's going to be reading from this article and I think my wife was with me and she had just opened it up on Salon and she said, you've got to get this guy to come here. So, um, you want to go? How you guys doing? Hey, is this thing is this thing on? Yeah. Do I need it? Hello? Do I need this? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. I think you need it. All right. Okay. I, I like how it looks. Um, <laughs> all right. So, I'm going to read the salon piece second. First, I'm going to read something that I published for uh, Cobalt Magazine. It's called Class Trip. So, um, I'll try to be as loud as possible. East Baltimore is my home. Murder's distension mixed with smoke from the pistols that continuously bang over 24-hour sirens. Baptist churches, Korean stores, and teenage dope dealers on the corners. Dauphines are mentors. Grandmas are 30 and pregnant. Automatic weapons are accessorized with multicolored Nikes. No one graduates for anything, and all the white people are cops and teachers. Black life expectancy is 16 if you're lucky, and the primary causes of death are dice games, diabetes, and drug overdoses. Class trip. My friend Taja, little brother Dion, and I were walking to school. A black Honda is sitting on a corner of Fayette Street. The tags are paper and the windows are cracked. A wisp of smoke floats out. The passengers see us and then pull off. You don't get no girls, man. You don't get no girls, man. I'm fucking with somebody like pow, 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 pow. After school, bet, yells Taja. Taja's tall with a tall face. I ignore him like I always do, while damping my index finger in saliva and decrusting Dion's face because even at age seven, he still cries and snots every hour on the hour. Dion snaps and pulls away with heavy eyes. He is mad that Taj and me and the rest of the seventh grade are going on a trip to the Smithsonian Museum in DC. He wanted to tag along, and I normally let him come everywhere with me, to dirt bike trails at bow checks where I hold my stunts, to run and jump the gates with me after I was at Patterson Park Pool, to teenage house parties with my lusty pants roaming friends, to every basketball game I ever played anywhere and everywhere else, but today is out of my hands. Taja and I have been talking about this trip for months. We both watched Jurassic Park 60 plus times. I'm sorry, this is small. <laughs> he flipped out on the way, oh, we both flipped out on the way that Raptors had flossed with Samuel L. Jackson's bones. We couldn't wait to see the real thing, or at least that fossils anyway. A block and a half away from the school, and we're half, and we're half an hour early, which is great for kids like us who normally arrive the second period. I hope I sit next to Tasha Jackson on the bus. Last year we took a bus trip to Fort McHenry and she let me stick my hand up her skirt. <laughs> I'm sitting next to Tasha, Tasha yells, aimlessly walking into oncoming traffic. Yo, pay attention, you almost got hit, I say, shouting, pulling him back to the curb. The same black Honda rides through the light, skimming us, and it slams on the brakes. I yank Tasha away just in time. A 20-something in the skull cap and Tim Boots hops out of the passenger side. Little man, y'all all right? He asks, looking left and looking right. His skin is the color of dark liquor and is mostly covered by an oversized army jacket with a linen Velcro. Yeah, we good, I reply. We got school. Cool, old man, y'all get in the car, the dude says. His forehead slopes over his eyes and he sounds like he smokes way too many, he sounds like he smokes way too much. Nah, man, our school right there, Taja answers with a little extra bass in his voice. Dude shows us a pistol peeking out of his waist and insists. 
Get in the fucking car and don't make a scene. He guides the three of us into the back of the Honda. It smells like Newports and oil change. The back seat and floor is covered with smashed cigarette boxes, Twinkie wrappers, blunt guts, and empty Hennessy bottles. Dion's about to cry in three, two, don't cry, Dion. We're gonna be okay, I whisper, while squeezing his trembling palm. We ride past Elwood Park and over the bridge on Eagle by some boarded up homes, and then the driver stops. My heart swells. I feel it pumping through three layers of clothes. The driver has yet to turn around. We face his back. I wonder what he sounds like. Do we know him? The full head guy spins around, cocking his gun. Not the one on his waist, but another that was wrapped in a plastic, super fresh bag. He brushes all of, the, he brushes all of our small noses with the tip. It crinkles when it reaches mine. I see the imprint of the gun through the blue plastic. It looks like a desert eagle. Yo, I know you Sean Mo's son. I know you got the house key. I know it's there. Kick it out, he says to Taja. Taja is Sean Mo's son. They even wear the same face. Sean Mo sells crap with my dad. He's tall and lanky as the towers that we live in. Everyone knows Sean Mo. He dresses in nothing but leather, even in the summertime. He always wears diamonds. He only drives Mercedes, and not the little C-class ones, but ones that say CL and SL on the back. He and my dad are best friends. They're inseparable. They always brag about how they make each other rich. Sometimes they get drunk and make me and Taja wrestle to see who has the toughest son. I ain't gonna kill y'all if y'all do what I say. He looks at Taja with his hands out. Taja reaches for his keys and squeaks. You're not gonna hurt my dad, is you? Nah, shorty chill, says the guy. I'm gonna holler at Sean right quick. We gonna let y'all go to school. He looks at the driver and he says, yo, if they try to hop out, kill him. The driver doesn't respond. He just nods. Our eyes well up at the notion. Todd just overflows first. I catch Dion's before they trickle, squeezing his hand tighter. His flesh reddens. I wanted to cry too. I'm beyond scared. We all are. We'll probably die. Kids get dumped in dumpsters and tossed behind buildings all of the time. I see it on TV. I hear it in music. Some of my friends are dead, and my older brother talks murder daily. I hope they don't toss us. I hope they don't kill Dion. I hope our family finds us, if they do, and we're not like those missing kids that hang on the walls at post offices in the markets. I want to scream, but I have to be strong for Dion. If I lose it, he'll lose it. Snot bubbles are foaming around Taj's nostrils. His face is drenched. Taj is all buck. He tries to act like a, he tries to be a gangster like his pops, but secretly he loves Power Rangers more than Dion. Sean Mo makes Taja wear a Hilfiger and Polo and Nike and proudly and, and he proudly accepts to it and presses dad. But Taja prefers his Red Ranger t-shirt and doesn't care about fresh sneakers or drugs or sex. Taja just likes being a kid. They whip around the corner to the top of Sean Mo's block, a row house not too far from our school. The dude hops out gun in hand. He runs toward Sean Mo's crib. The driver cuts on Wu-Tang Clan and sparks a sick. M-E-T-H-O-D, man, bumps out of the flat speakers with no bass. I can smell, hear, and taste our anxiety. The driver's anxiety, too. He cracks the Hennessy bottle and takes a huge swig. I wipe Dion's tears on my hoodie. I'm so proud of him from not screaming. Taja is a wet statue. His fumes has fogged up the back window as he wept. The driver turns up Method Man. The dude is jogging back up the street five minutes later, or so has passed. He jumps back into the Honda. Done. Dropped him off at the top of the block. He yells. He tells the driver while reaching for the Hennessy. The driver shifts the car into gear. Hold up, the passenger says. He opens the car door and throws the gun into the saw hole. Now drive. We were next, I thought. Taj is shaking more than Dion. I'm envisioning my own death. I think I'm ready. I squeeze my eyes tight. So tight I felt my brain cringe. Listen, I want y'all to run up the alley to the end of the block and don't turn around. When you get there, take Madison and walk your little ass to the school. Don't say shit. If I hear police will think that y'all are trying to be slick, he said with jiggly cheeks and spit ringing on us. I'm gonna kill all of you. Now go run. The car stops, we fling the doors open and exit a hard ass like Olympic runners up the alley. Pass fiends through mounds of trash towards Madison. Dion falls, his book bag hits the ground and empty pages scatter. His hands are scraped and bloody. I help him up and we keep booking. Taja, 25 lengths in front of us, never stops. The three of us breathe like asthma patients once we reach the top of the block. Should we, should we go to school now? Taja pants, both hands on his knees. I cover Dion's ears. No, we gotta go check on your dad. We drop Dion off with my mom and we walk back over to Sean Moe's block. The whole neighborhood's outside. Yellow tape separates them from the crib. Cop uniforms strung strong off a bunch of shouting ebony faces with Taj's stepmother in the center of it all screaming, why, why? Taj's knees hit the concrete. I cover his face with my coat. I don't want him to see the ambulance workers bring his dad out on a stretcher. I muffle his coughs and sniffs as they walk Sean Moe's lifeless body down the steps. His left arm dangles over the edge of the stretcher. He still had his diamond bracelet on. 
Two plainclothes cops snatch Taja's stepmom, probably homicide. Her satin robe is blood pinkish and barely covers her bottom. She doesn't care. She just witnessed her husband's murder. I use all of my strength to pull Taja up and away from the scene. So that's the first one I just did with Cobalt. Um, I don't want to go over my time, so I'm going to jump into this salon essay really quick. Um, this is the one where most people know me from as of now. Too poor for pop cultures. Miss Cheryl Dante Buckethead and I compiled out loose change for a fifth of vodka. I'm the only driver, so I went to get it. On the way back, I laughed at a local radio station going on and on and on, still buzzing about Obama taking a selfie with Nelson at Nelson Mandela's funeral. At Nelson Mandela's funeral. Who cares? No, really, especially since the funeral was weeks ago. I arrived with a flip of vodka in hand, clenched close to me like a newborn. Three red cold cups covering the top. We play spades over at Miss Cheryl's house place in La Trobe Housing Project every few weeks. Actually, Miss Cheryl's name isn't really Miss Cheryl, but I changed it to protect her from the story I'm about to tell. Her court is semi-boarded up third world. It looks like an ad for the wire. Even though her complex is disgustingly unfit, it's still overpopulated with tilting dolphins, barefoot children, pregnant smokers, women with diabetes, tattooed face tenants, and a diverse collection of Zimmermans made up of street dudes and housing police looking itchy to shoot anyone young, black, and in Nike. Two taps on the door, it opened, and the gang was all there. Four disenfranchised African Americans posted up in a 9-11 present size tenement, one of those spots where you enter through the front door, take a half step, and land in the yard. I call this disenfranchised because Obama selfie with some random lady or the whole selfie movement in general is more important than us and the conditions where we dwell. Surprisingly, as tight as Miss Cheryl unit may be, it's still more than enough space for us to receive affordable joy from a 50 cent box of cards and a real bottle. And yo, Michelle was gonna beat on Barack for taking that selfie with that chick at the Mandela wait, whatever the fuck a selfie is. What's a selfie, some type of bailout? Yelled Dante from the kitchen, dumping Utz chips into a cracked flowery bowl. I was placing cubes into all of our cups and equally distributing the vodka like some for you, some for you, and some for you. What the fuck is a selfie, said Miss Cheryl. When a stupid person with a smartphone flicks themselves and looks at it, I say to the room. She replied with a raised eyebrow, oh. It's amazing how news seems so instant to most of my generation with our iPhones, Wi-Fi, tablets, and iPads, but actually it isn't. The idea of information being class-based as well became evident to me when I watched my friends talk about a week old, a week old news story as if it happened yesterday. Miss Cheryl doesn't have a computer and definitely wouldn't know what a selfie is. Her cell runs on minutes and doesn't have a camera. Like many of us, she's too poor to participate in pop culture. She's on public assistance, living in public housing, and scrambles for odd jobs to survive. Cheryl lost her job as a cook moments after she lost her daughter to heroin, her son needed a crack, and her kidneys to soul food. It took 15 to 20 unanswered applications a week for over a year for her to realize that no company wants to employ a woman on dialysis. Sometimes Bucket, uh, Buckethead and I chip in and buy groceries for her and her grandson, Kevin, who has severe lead paint poisoning, but was diagnosed late, and he's too old to receive a check. Buckethead is a convicted felon, but not really. He was charged with a crime that he didn't commit. I know this because my late cousin did the shooting and our whole neighborhood watch. Bucket was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and as many know, we are products of a no-snitching culture. As a result, the only work Bucket can find after 10 years of false imprisonment is that of a laborer with the Mexicans who post up in front of 7-Eleven on Broadway or as a freelance dishwasher. Bucket's no angel, but he's not a felon. It doesn't deserve to be excluded from pop culture, no more than Miss Cheryl or Dante, who represents the definition of redemption to me. I placed our cups at the table and the bottom in the center. Me and Miss Cheryl are gonna whoop y'all ass tonight in spades. I, I, hurry up, Dante, I yell. Dante cleans nonstop. Roach is sleeping in the fridge. Roach is relay racing out of the cabinets, carrying cereal boxes, purchasing homes, building families, slipping through the cracks for fun, and weaving in and out of death. Dante bleaches them all. Dante doesn't take handouts from us and won't go on government assistance. He couldn't contribute to the chips and vodka that week, so he claimed for Miss Cheryl, and he would claim for Miss Cheryl even if there was no chips and vodka. Boy, we ready to play cards. Stop acting selfie and sit your ass at the table, yelled Miss Cheryl from another room. We all laughed. Miss Cheryl rooms are separated by white sheets. They look like soil ghosts at night when the wind blows. Her son Meaty stole and sold all of her doors years ago, and housing never replaced them. Dante joined us at the table. Take a forever boy with them big ass feet, yelled a happy bucket. Dante was wearing my old shoes. Their size 13's busted at the seams, but Dante's a size 8 and his foot is dangling through the side. His arms are chunked and wrapped in heel sores from years of drug abuse. 
He's eight years clean off of the hard stuff now, but I met him way back when I was 13 in his wild days. He was huddled over his girlfriend in the alley behind my house. I watched moments before she performed an abortion on herself with a twisted coat hanger. She screamed like the sirens we hear our day. I couldn't stop looking at her. He gazed too, in and out, in and out of a nod, and then signaled for me to help. I joined them. Together we dragged her to Johns Hopkins, which was under a mile away. Blood scabbed and dried, blood scabbed and dried on my hands. Nikes and hooping shorts. She lived until she OD'd months later. I've been cool with Dante ever since. I'm trying to get them roach eggs. He 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 he. Gotta get the bleach on the roach eggs. Then he won't come back, Dante replied as he sat at the table. I dealt the first hand. Miss Sherry reminded me to deal to the left. Always deal to the left, boy. The rule don't change, she said. She has the widest jaws in the history of Y and jaws. Thicker than both of her bloated caramel arms, which are thigh sized. I collected the cards, reshuffled, and dealt to the left. And there we were. My job hungry, unemployed old heads and me, the overworked college professor. College professor? Not the professor that makes hundreds of thousands of dollars for teaching one class a year, but a broke ass adjunct who makes hundreds of dollars for teaching thousands of class a year. <laughs> the other day I read an article about an adjunct who died in a homeless shelter and I wasn't surprised. Panhandlers make triple and trust me, I've done the research, I should be looking for a corner to set up shop. I have a little more than my friends, but I still feel that pain. My equation for survival was teaching three co teaching at three colleges, freelance web design, freelance graphic design, rap video director, wedding photographer, and tutor. The proceeds from all of these are swallowed by my mortgage, cigarettes, rail vodka, and ramen noodles. I used to eat free range organic shit. I used to live in Whole Foods. I used to drink top shelf. I used to be able to afford pop culture. But long gone are the days when I pump crack into the very neighborhood where we hold our card game. Eons since I had to stay up all night counting money until my fingers cramped. Since I had to lie on my back and kick my safe clothes, and I wore and treated Gucci like Hanes, and I drove a Mercedes, and I gave X5 to my girlfriends, my good old days. Eventually, though, eventually the mass death of my close friends caused me to leave the drug game in search of a better life. Ten plus years and three college degrees later, I'm back where I started, just like my car playing friends. Too poor to participate in pop culture. Too poor to give a fuck about a selfie or what Kanye said or Beyonce's new album in the 17 videos it came with. Put me on a bomb cab when you get a chance, college boy, Cheryl says to me as I contemplate the number of books I can make out of my shitty hand. We all laugh. I'm the only one in the room with the skill set to figure it out. But we all really, but we all really see Obamacare as another bill. And for what I hear, the website is as broke as we are. We love Barack. <laughs> we love Barack. We love Michelle, their lovely daughters, and their dog. Bo, as much as any African-American family, but not like in 2008. The Obama feeling in 2008 isn't the same as the Obama feeling in 2014. Obama's had his dream chasing in, 28, in, 2000, in 2008. My friends and I wanted him to be our dad and our best friend and our mentor and our favorite uncle and shit. We wanted to take selfies with him. He was a biracial swirl of black and white Jesus sent to deliver us, to bless people stuck under the slums like Cheryl, Bucket, Dante, and I with jobs, access to the definition of words like selfie, and hope, real hope. But in 2014, it feels like the same, it feels the same as Bush, Clinton, or any other president. The rich are copping new boats, and we're still using the oven to heat up our houses in the winter while eating our cereal with forks to preserve milk. America still feels like America, a place where you have to pay to play any and everywhere, even here at our broke ass card game. 1 a.m. rolls around and we're all faded. Everyone with Miss Cheryl, that's because dialysis prohibits her from drinking. My kidney pounds. Her 2008 Obama for President t-shirt stares back at me all stretched out of shape, making Barack look like Sinbad. No one knows who won because really we all lost. Dante's asleep because I saw the roaches creeping back out and Bucket staggered out. I looked at Miss Cheryl. We could take a late night selfie, but I swapped my iPhone for a Boost Mobile, that $30 payment. She laughed and said, baby, what's a selfie again? Thank you.